On behalf of the International Association of Providers of AIDS Care, or IAPAC, welcome to our Learning Academy. I am Dr. Jose Zuniga, IAPAC's President and Chief Executive Officer. The Learning Academy's mission is to coordinate multidisciplinary online educational activities to support optimal care for people living with and affected by HIV, syndemic conditions, and comorbid diseases. Moreover, we place an emphasis on person-centered care, as well as addressing challenges faced by people who are vulnerable to HIV, viral hepatitis, tuberculosis, and non-communicable diseases. This educational activity is focused on utilizing a quality improvement approach to eliminate HIV stigma in healthcare settings. Its aim is to provide an overview of current evidence-based strategies and interventions. The first module will address the impact of HIV and intersectional stigma within health systems and in healthcare settings on access to and utilization of HIV services, as well as HIV and other health outcomes. And the second module will address utilization of a quality improvement approach to eliminate HIV stigma in healthcare settings, leveraging routine measurement of stigma and discrimination, team-based learning, root cause analyses, and tests of change. My colleagues and I hope that you derive benefit from the educational content delivered by IPAC's Vice President and Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Chris Duncombe. Welcome to this webinar on utilizing a quality improvement approach to eliminating HIV stigma in healthcare settings. My name is Dr. Chris Duncan. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at the International Association of Providers of AIDS Care, and I will be your presenter for today. The image that you see on the left is a PDSA cycle, and we all discuss this in more detail in the second half of the webinar when we talk about continuous quality improvement. This activity is accredited by the University of Miami. I have no financial disclosures and the activity was made possible by an educational grant from Gilead Sciences. The learning objectives for this webinar are as follows. First, to describe the impact of HIV and intersectional stigma within health systems and in healthcare settings on access to and utilization of HIV services, as well as HIV and other health outcomes. The second learning objective is to explain how to utilize a quality improvement or QI approach to eliminating HIV stigma in healthcare settings, leveraging routine measurement of stigma and discrimination, team-based learning, root cause analysis, and tests of change. So let's start with some simple definitions of stigma and discrimination. First of all, stigma. Stigma is defined as a social process of de devaluing a person, beginning with marking or labeling someone's differences and attributing negative values to those differences. The graphic on the left illustrates this process in the context of HIV and populations who are vulnerable for HIV. People who are stigmatized because they are living with HIV, because they engage in sex work or drug use, or express different gender norms fall victim to marginalization, becoming the subjects of harassment, abuse, discrimination, and violence. Within a healthcare setting, they are also sometimes provided with poor quality health services. The results of marginalization can include poor social and emotional well being, engaging in risky behaviors and situations, and in some instances, an exacerbation of economic circumstances, including poverty, which can result in sickness and other poor health outcomes. Stigma is a threat to public health. It influences health outcomes in many ways, carving pathways to health disparities. Now more than ever, greater attention needs to be paid to this social determinant of health to ensure the success of future improvement efforts in disrupting the processes that adversely impact patient outcomes. Stigma is a fundamental cause of population health inequities. It disrupts multiple life domains, including financial resources, social relationships, coping behaviors, and it has a negative impact on the health of populations. It must be considered along with the other determinants of health as a major contributor to poor health outcomes. The other determinants of health include income, poverty, social protection, education, 
and food and housing insecurity. Turning now to discrimination. Discrimination is defined as the unfair and unjust treatment of individuals on the basis of a real or a perceived characteristic such as HIV status, age, race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, housing situation, immigration status or criminal record. Because discrimination tends to be preceded by stigma, it is considered a form of enacted stigma. Discrimination can be experienced at the individual, facility, community or national level. At the national level, laws, policies and practices may perpetuate discrimination in healthcare settings, prohibiting or discouraging people from seeking the health services that they need and to which they are entitled. Discrimination is also a public health threat. According to the 2015 Stress in America survey, people who say they face discrimination rate their stress levels on average as higher than those who do not experience discrimination. That's true across racial and ethnic groups. Chronic stress can lead to a wide variety of physical and mental health problems and discrimination has been linked to issues including anxiety, depression, obesity and substance use. Stigma and discrimination are intimately related. While stigma is a belief or attitude, the action resulting from stigma is discrimination. For example, men who have sex with men may be denied access to all avail available HIV prevention options, including pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP, because of judgments made by healthcare workers based on their personal values and beliefs. People living with HIV may be refused treatment in a health facility because of their HIV status or because they belong to highly stigmatized key populations such as people who inject drugs. A patient's HIV status or sexual identity may be revealed publicly in violation of their right to confidentiality. Discrimination also takes the form of physical or verbal abuse or voluntary or coercive treatment such as forced contraception or abortion. Stigma and discrimination may go unrecognised or unnoticed by healthcare workers who automatically make judgments about people without realising how these judgments will affect the quality of the health services they deliver and how they can have a lasting impact on the health and well-being of their patients. The talk will now address the impact of HIV and intersectional stigma within health systems and healthcare settings. Intersectionality is an analytical framework for understanding how aspects of a person's social and political identities combine to create different modes of discrimination and privilege. Intersectionality identifies multiple factors of advantage and disadvantage. The example on the right illustrates the multiple intersecting stigmas that may be faced by transgender women living with HIV. These include transphobia, sexism, racism, substance use stigma, sex work stigma, classism and gender non-conforming stigma. The National Transgender Discrimination Survey, a, a joint partnership between the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force and the National Centre for Gender Equality, was the largest survey of transgender discrimination undertaken. Results were reported in June of this year. The survey included 6,450 respondents from all 50 states and several territories with a geographic and racial distribution approximating that of the general US population. Nearly one in five respondents, or 19%, reported being refused care because they were transgender or gender non-conforming. 28% of respondents were subject to harassment in medical settings. 50% of the sample reported having to actually teach their care providers about transgender care. Respondents reported more than four times the national average of HIV infection and a staggering 41% of respondents reported attempting suicide. This is compared to 1.6% of the general population. Findings on unemployment and economic insecurity provided an overview of the pervasive unemployment rates, poverty levels and housing instability 
that transgender and gender non-conforming people face. The task force executive director noted that healthcare is a fundamental human right, but that this study clearly documents it is regularly being denied to transgender and gender non-conforming people. The study also provides information about the serious health impact of discrimination that transgender people face. As another example of intersectionality, let's look at addiction stigma. The stigma towards people who use drugs causes emotional, mental and physical distress, but it also affects their chances of accessing healthcare, finding and keeping employment, it, it affects their food security and their housing. Stigma impacts care seeking behaviour and access to harm reduction and other targeted services. Intersectional stigma increases risky behaviours such as and in, enforces socio health care problems. As I just mentioned, one of the most significant consequences of stigma in healthcare settings is its driver of gaps in access to prevention and treatment services. Within health facilities, common drivers can include negative attitudes, fear, beliefs, lack of awareness about the medical condition itself, inability to clinically manage the medical condition. Stigma in health facilities negatively affects people seeking services at a time when they are at their most vulnerable. In health facilities, manifestations of stigma are widely documented, ranging from outright denial of care, provision of substandard care, physical and verbal abuse. As I mentioned earlier, healthcare workers may be unaware of how stigma manifests and affects people, and may therefore not be cognizant of the stigmatizing effects of their actions. An improved understanding of how stigma in healthcare settings is addressed is needed to identify these gaps and improve investments in stigma reduction. Here's an example of stigma and discrimination from the United States. The survey was conducted as part of the US People Living with HIV Stigma Index in Michigan in 2016. It revealed the most common manifestation of stigma and discrimination was denial of healthcare services. That's the bar on the far left. This was closely followed in the two bars on the right of that by housing discrimination, health insurance and employment. Overall, 9 to 11 percent of people reported discrimination in healthcare, housing and access to insurance because of their HIV status. Established in New York City, the Stigma Resilience Commission is a multi-sectorial interdisciplinary coalition of HIV-related organisations, affected communities, non-traditional partners, public health officials, academic researchers, to devise strategies to overcome HIV-related stigma in communities and healthcare systems and to promote resilience among those disenfranchised from available services. The coalition mapped and evaluated ongoing activities to reduce HIV stigma and promote resilience in healthcare systems and communities. It characterised implementation barriers and, and facilitators and identified gaps. It identified sites where stigma reduction and resiliency promotion interventions were most needed, were most feasible, and it engaged clinical sites in employing quality improvement practices to address stigma around HIV sexual orientation, gender identity and mental health status. HIV, mental health and physical disability stigma can intersect and may interact with other forms of stigma related to social identity such as race, gender and sexuality. Stigma is especially problematic for people living with these conditions because it can create barriers to them accessing services as I said before. Bring Change to Mind is a non-profit organisation focused on encouraging dialogue around mental health and raising awareness, understanding and empathy. Actress and activist Glenn Close co-founded Bring Change to Mind in 2010 after her sister and nephew were diagnosed with mental illness. It offers resources and tools to learn how to take action to reduce stigma. Are You Really OK? is a campaign by the Mental Health, Health Coalition, spearheaded by designer Kenneth Cole, model Kendall Jenner, and singer and songwriter Keisha and partners. 
The focus of the coalition is fighting stigma through the sharing of stories under the tagline of How Are You Really? Published in the American Journal of Public Health uh, in June of 2022, this paper looked at addressing stigma as a primary driving factor of health inequities and a barrier to health care seeking behaviour in the United States. It identified the scope and nature of the program work to reduce intersectional stigma and improve health-related outcomes. There are several interventions explicitly designed to address stigma. Some of the recommendations in the paper include prioritise community ownership, education and, co and connectedness, incorporate the perceptions and experiences of frontline workers and service providers, conduct more intersectional stigma interventions and evaluations, develop a database of research and community efforts to address intersectional stigma, and addressing the misalignment of funding. So what funders value and what community needs is there is, there is a disconnect there. A key strategy for addressing the drivers of stigma has been participatory training with health facility staff. Team-based learning provides an active, structured form of small group learning. Globally, a growing number of healthcare facilities have adopted team-based learning in a variety of combinations across diverse settings and content areas. There is now good evidence that small group teaching provides a fruitful academic environment which optimises learning, particularly in healthcare settings, and especially when compared to lectures, for example. Small group teaching provides opportunities for learners to collaborate and promote team building skills. These skills are essential for people working in healthcare settings. In the next section of this webinar, we will examine the concept of continuous quality improvement as it pertains to stigma and the delivery of healthcare services. Continuous quality improvement, or CQI, is defined as a deliberate, defined process which is focused on activities that are responsive to community needs and improve population health. It is a continuous and ongoing effort to achieve measurable improvements in the efficiency, effectiveness, performance, accountability, outcomes and other indicators of quality programming. Quality improvement is a systematic, data-guided set of activities designed to bring about immediate improvement in healthcare delivery in particular settings. Further continuous quality improvement is a theory-based management system that looks at processes and outcomes. It assesses cultural change. It has a client-centered philosophy. It uses tools to help quantify what we do. It searches for common causes of variation. It is driven by data. It has system process and client feedback, and it uses shared success and a long-term approach. Some CQI concepts here, the quality can be defined by how well we meet the needs of those we serve. Most problems are in fact in process and not caused by people. Unintended variation in process can lead to unwanted variation in outcomes. Continual improvement can be achieved through serial experimentation. Continuous quality improvement in healthcare seeks to examine the current state, in this case culturally responsive care delivery, and how to use people, processes and technology, such as medical records and SMS, to achieve a future state of improved patient care and outcomes, improved population health and cost effectiveness. HIV-related stigma in health settings undermine, undermines efforts to control the HIV epidemic by compromising access to services. Quality improvement uses plan, do, study, act, or PDSA cycles in a structured approach to achieving, to identifying, achieving, testing, and adopting interventions to reduce stigma and discrimination. The PDSA cycle tests a change by developing a plan to test the change, we call the plan, identifying, carrying out the test, which is the do phase, observe and learning the consequences, which is the study phase, and determining what modifications need to be made 
to the test, which is the ACT phase. The beauty of the PDS PDSA cycle method lies in learning as quickly as possible whether an intervention works in a particular setting and making adjustments accordingly to increase the chances of delivering and sustaining the desired improvement. In contrast to other methods, PDSA allows new learning to be built into an experimental process. If problems are identified with the original plan, then the theory can be revised to build on this learning and a subsequent experiment conducted to see if it has resolved the problem. In the complex social systems of healthcare, this flexibility and adaptability of a PDSA cycle are important features that support the adaptation of interventions to work in the local setting. Often PDSA cycles are depicted as a ramp. The ramp starts on the left with theories and ideas to which are added evidence-based data derived from cycles by learning and doing. As we adapt the ideas that we test and conduct follow-up tests on a larger scale, we build on our knowledge of what works best. We are therefore able to hone in on the right solution before we move to a larger scale. A successful PDSA process does not equal a successful QI program. Other key components include accountability, good management, driven by all levels of staff and stakeholders, teamwork, and continuous review of the process. So let's look at the PDSA cycles in a bit more detail. The planning phase establishes the objectives and processes required to deliver the desired results. It includes four steps. Write a problem statement. Describe what you want to accomplish in an aim statement. Try to answer three fundamental questions. What are we trying to accomplish? How will we know that a change is an improvement? What change can we make that will result in improvement? Thirdly, identify the root cause of the problem. And fourthly, develop an action plan, including necessary staff, resources, and a timeline. In the do phase, the objectives and processes from the planning phase are implemented. Start to implement the action plan. Be sure to collect data as you go to help you evaluate your plan. In stage three, document problems, unexpected effects, and general observations. In the study phase, the data and results gathered from the do phase are evaluated. Data are compared to the expected outcomes to see if there are any similarities or differences. The testing process is also evaluated to see if there are any changes from the original test that can be created in the planning phase. Finally, the ACT phase is where the process is improved. Records from the do and study phases help identify issues with the process. The issues may include problems, non-conformities, opportunities for improvement, inefficiencies, and other issues that result in outcomes that are evidently less than optimal. Root causes of such issues are investigated, found and eliminated by modifying the process. Risk is re-evaluated. Planning for the next cycle can proceed with a better baseline. We will next review some strategies for, for quality improvement from the US and internationally. The HIVQOL project represents the joint efforts of the New York State Department of Health and AIDS Institute and the Health Resources and Services Administration, HIV AIDS Bureau. Key HIVQOL project goals and objectives are to improve the quality of care for persons receiving HIV care, promote quality improvement activities, promote self-reporting of HIV performance measurement data based on clinical guidelines, provide site-specific consultation to build quality improvement capacity which is responsive to specific organizational needs. HIVQOL is a model for capacity building for quality management that is designed to improve care. The program consists of three elements, quality improvement, performance measurement, and infrastructure and capacity building. HIVQOL uses the following methods. It uses coaching, 
on-site mentoring of a national team based on Ministry of Health that emphasises structure, planning and QI projects supplemented by training workshops. It uses performance management. This is facility level data are collected and used to improve care in participating clinics. Data are aggregated to produce regional and national benchmark reports. Implementation QI projects focus on improving selected aspects of ambulatory care through process investigation and small tests of change. And these small tests of change are the PDSA cycles that we mentioned before. It uses peer learning. These are regional groups are created for providers and facilities to share experiences and facilitate coordination of quality improvement work. And finally, local government sponsorship of regional groups drives the process. The HIFQOL workbook is based and structured on the HIFQOL model and its program and project cycles. Workbook content explains the purpose of each cycle and then describes the key tasks for successful completion. The program cycle focuses on the necessary steps to plan, build and sustain a HIV specific quality infrastructure, while the project cycle shows how to implement a quality initiative to improve one aspect of HIV care. The HIVQOL work book provides you with a practical guide for improving the quality of HIV care, offering step-by-step -step guidance on how to build a quality program, orchestrate quality improvements, and then sustain those improvements. Let's look at another example of reducing HIV-related stigma and discrimination in healthcare settings through peer learning and the application of quality improvement methods. This example is the Stigma Reduction Quality Improvement Learning Network in four countries in Southeast Asia. The countries are Cambodia, the Lao People's Democratic Republic, Thailand and Vietnam, where the HIV epidemic is highly concentrated amongst key populations of men who have sex with men, sex workers, transgender people, and people who inject drugs. HIV-related stigma and discrimination is further compounded by cultural, social, and institutional factors that discourage care-seeking behavior, undermine treatment self-efficacy, and normalize marginalization. Addressing stigma and discrimination is critical to reaching these key populations and ensuring that their HIV prevention and treatment services are responsive to their unique identities, needs and circumstances. The network was launched in 27 by University of California, San Francisco, with support from HRSA's Quality Improvement Project to accelerate integration of stigma and discrimination reduction activities into routine HIV quality management programming in Cambodia, Lao PDR, Thailand and Vietnam through continuous measurement, QI methods and peer-to-peer -peer learning and exchange. As part of network activities, health facilities in participating countries measured HIV-related stigma and discrimination amongst healthcare workers on a continuous basis using common indicators from a validated survey tool. In addition, these facilities routinely collected data on patients' experiences and treatment literacy through structured questionnaires, patient forums, and clinical encounters. In the box on the left side, some examples of the standardized survey questionnaires included, have you observed healthcare worker colleagues unwillingly unwilling to care for people living with HIV in your facility? Have you observed healthcare worker colleagues providing poor quality of care to people living with HIV? Do you typically wear two pairs of gloves when caring for somebody with HIV? Do you think women with HIV should be allowed to have babies? So here we see some results from the survey. Almost 50% of people said that they worry about getting HIV while taking blood from a person living with HIV. Almost 50% said that women living with HIV should not be allowed to have babies. And more than 20% said they observed colleagues providing poor standard of care to people living with HIV in their healthcare facilities. Using data from the surveys, patient feedback and clinical performance data, facilities applied QI methods, process mapping, 
again the plan, do, study, act cycles to identify root causes of suboptimal outcomes and implement contextually tailored interventions to improve identified gaps. Through this process, a broader conceptualization of quality of care is forged in which stigma and, stigma and discrimination reduction activities and people-centered services are delivered explicitly designed to attain the 95-95-95 goals. To share successes and challenges and to create implementation strategies, teams from participating ministries of health convened on a quarterly basis. During these meetings, participants discussed translation of policy into data-driven practice at the facility level and develop plans for scale-up and sustainability based on experiences from their peers and content experts. By design, the network seeks to foster peer learning exchange at multiple levels. And on the right side, you can see the local level, the national level and the international level. We're going to move now to another country, this time Zimbabwe. The guidelines for antiretroviral therapy for prevention and treatment of HIV in Zimbabwe recommend immediate treatment. To implement these guidelines, the Ministry of Health and Child Care adopted the policy of treat all. With support from PEPFAR and HRSA, Quality Improvement Capacity, the project launched a quality improvement collaborative called Art for All. From February 2017 to August 2018, a total of 26,655 patients were new to care across 27 collaborative sites. The monthly aggregate proportion of new to care patients who initiated ART on the same day increased from 48% in February of 2017 to 77% in August of 2018. And overall 70% of new to care patients were initiated on ART on the same day of diagnosis. Moving back to the US again now and the HRSA Ryan White HIV AIDS program. In the last three decades, care for individuals with HIV has advanced and improvements have been accomplished for many, but gaps in care still exist. Reductions in HIV related morbidity and mortality are uneven across HIV populations. Gaps exist between the quality of care that should be provided and the quality of care that people actually receive. Providers and patients have called for action to improve quality of care for people living with HIV and to advance HIV care for all populations. Many providers face barriers when trying to deliver quality HIV care to every patient every time. Since 2000, Ryan White legislation has included specific provisions directing each recipient to establish and sustain effective clinical management programs. However, after years of reauthorization, many Ryan White program funded recipients still lack the knowledge and skills needed to craft sustainable quality management improvement programs. The HRSA Ryan White HIV AIDS Program Center for Quality Improvement and Innovation CQII provides leadership and support in quality improvement for Ryan White program recipients and sub-recipients nationwide. On-site quality assistance includes quality improvement collaboratives, training programs, national technical assistance calls, outline resources, publications and exhibits, quality awards and consumer involvement activities. CQII meets unique needs both on-site and virtually and provides no-cost technical assistance designed to meet the quality management needs of recipients and sub-recipients. Past assistance has included utilizing quality performance data to build momentum for quality improvement activities, implementing local quality improvement initiatives, training staff and consumers on quality management, and fostering leadership support for quality management. CQII has led many national collaboratives to build capacity for quality improvement by providing open discussion about improvement efforts and creating human connections. 
Some examples include strengthening quality management related collaborations, measuring sets of standards of performance indicators, conducting joint quality improvement projects, and conducting routine assessment using standardized quality management assessment tools. CQII also offers three advanced training programs. The Training of Trainer program builds capacity for quality improvement by expanding the pool of qualified trainers. The Training of Quality Leaders program builds individual capacity to effectively lead and facilitate quality improvement activities. The Training on Coaching Basics program closes educational gaps by building the quality improvement capacity of quality leaders to coach other HIV providers on quality improvement. CQII has launched a new virtual quality improvement program called QI Learning Lab. Labs are offered throughout the year and consist of an orientation session, six 90-minute learning sessions every two weeks, and a capstone session where participants return three to six months later to present their quality improvement projects. QI Learning Lab comprises live virtual interactive sessions that utilize case-based learning with real-world examples addressing HIV gaps across the continuum of care. The learning labs provide a space for discussion with peers as well as feedback by content experts. So let's look at what we've learned. Um, intersecting stigmas affect people from many walks of life. Intersecting stigmas are especially common in marginalized people. PDSA cycles are an important strategy in continuous quality improvement. And some examples of continuous quality improvement were provided from the United States and from international areas. IAPAC is proud to be partnered with the UK community-based organisation NAZ, the Global HIV Collaborative and the Fast Track Cities Institute to commemorate an annual Zero HIV Stigma Day. July 21st has been chosen as Zero HIV Stigma Day to honour the late Prudence Marbella, the first black South African woman to publicly share her HIV status and a prominent AIDS activist whose birthday is July 21st. We intend to use this annual commemoration day to advance bold and intentional activities aimed at mitigating the impact of HIV stigma in partnership with affected communities. We need your engagement to collectively lead the charge to end HIV stigma once and for all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for participating in this IAPAC Learning Academy educational activity. I appreciate your commitment to delivering quality, person-centered HIV care that leaves no one behind. Now more than ever, our efforts must be focused on regaining momentum to avert AIDS-related deaths, stem new HIV infections, and eliminate HIV-related stigma. As a clinician, you are critical to those efforts.